Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to another another webinar Wednesday hosted by the Cal State Bakersfield Small Business Development Center. I'm Kelly Bearden. I am the director of the SBDC and it is February 14th, 2024, episode number 309 of Webinar Wednesday. And we are ag related today and look at that beautiful vineyard in my background. What is up today, February 14th? Well, first of all, happy Valentine's Day to everybody. A lot of happy retailers out there that are uh, that are doing well on this day, maybe the last couple of days. Uh, here, as I mentioned, in Central California, we're having an ag celebration with the International Ag Expo in Tulare, formerly known as the Tulare Farm Show. So... Who else do we bring in other than our agricultural specialist? And Dr. Aaron Hedgay will join us, and he'll join the party today, and we'll talk about agriculture at CSUB and a lot of things going on in Kern County and a lot of programs, great things coming our way. We're also going to talk about a few things that are going away, and one of those things going away is going to be PPP forgiveness. Didn't expect to be talking about PPP forgiveness in the year 2024, but in March it is going away and there's still a million loans we have seen that are not forgiven. And so if you have been paying on your PPP and for some reason or another, you did not get it forgiven and there might be a hang up, your last chance is coming up. You only have a few short weeks. So we'll talk briefly about that again, but also a little bit about the employee retention credit and some of the amnesty details that are associated with that particular program. If you recall, that is a program out of the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, that has actually a tax credit, and it's an employee retention tax credit. And uh, it's created a lot of, uh, well, a lot of uh, mischief in a lot of different areas, and we'll talk briefly about that. We'll talk about the Corporate Transparency Act and the need under that act to produce a beneficial ownership information filing. There's changes to that as this program continues to evolve and change, and there's new due dates on what uh, owners have in order to provide that information, and we'll talk briefly on that today, too. Uh, our capital corner, as we're on the Briefly concept, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the ag programs that might be available, our capital quarter, a regular feature on Webinar Wednesday, and we'll talk about a little about that, and we'll have our community calendar updates for February, our economic corner, ask about inflation and stocks. If we have time today, you know, we don't only have the chair of the Grimm Family Center for Agricultural Business our expert at CSUB on agriculture, along with Dr. John Deal, of course, the head of ag economics. But also we have an economist and there were some big things happening yesterday on the stock market and with an inflation report. So maybe we won't wait till next week when our resident economist joins us and talk a little bit about that if we have time today. As always, your questions, we'll answer them live. So put your questions in the Q&A box. Maureen Busher-Ding is working again as our producer, our webinar producer, and she'll be putting items in the chat box. So we'll have that going in the chat. You have a question you want to answer, put it in the Q&A. We'll get to that at the end. And um, also some of the resources that are going on in a very simple, relatable poll for today. So let's go to our poll, our one question little poll today. And almost we're just going to have a couple of different questions you know, related to the Ag Expo, but just decided to have one simple one. And the question is, is at the World Ag Expo, which ag segment is most represented? Is it trees and vines, dairy and livestock, or is it government? A lot of government entities. You notice I didn't put cotton. No, oh, cotton, no, those old cotton pickers, they're not around anymore. So but we got a lot of trees and nut trees and we got a lot of vines and we got a lot of cows and uh, we got a, a lot of government programs out there. So which is most represented, at least was most represented in 2023. So we do have 30% of you participating. You're working to get that number up just a little bit. 
And again, our one question on the World Ag Expo is which agricultural segment is most represented? And this is uh, gauged by the number of exhibitors of which last year over 1200 exhibitors. And in what particular field is it dairy and livestock government or is it trees and vines? Okay, one last second to jump in here, trying to get that up just a little higher in participation, but I am going to end the poll and close it at this time as we speak and share the results with you. And 63% of you say dairy and livestock. And you would happen to be correct. Good job. There we go. Dairy and livestock is well represented. Uh, nearly 16% of all exhibitors in that particular field. Trees and vines are a close second. And while government falls a little farther behind, a lot of state, federal, and local government entities. Uh, probably under that are those a lot of those entities from out of state trying to lure some of our agricultural businesses away, which you'll see at the Tulare Farm Show as well. So thank you for participating in our poll today. You know, the other thing that's interesting is the number of attendees. I almost was going to ask you this, how many people attended last year? And then I said, I'll just give you that answer. And the answer was over 112,000 people attended the show last year. From 49 states and a whole slew of countries. I, I do want to know that state that's not represented from the United States. I'm betting it's either like Rhode Island or maybe New Hampshire. But 49 of the 50 states, if anybody knows that answer, please put it in the chat for me because it is bugging me a little bit today. Okay, so we will stop with the poll and move right along and show you a picture, a little graphic picture of the World Ag Expo that is going on right now. And so uh, it is going on right now. I was scheduled to be there yesterday. I unfortunately did not make it, uh, but uh, who knows, maybe tomorrow. And let's get right along with our local programs and some of our local programs that we're still kind of following our key local programs. Uh, we will be talking about the employee retention credit and the amnesty. Um, the regular program for this where if you had not put in your application and you had not uh, uh, wanted to get the retention credit, it is now paused officially paused, and it's likely closed uh, because of a lot of the problems that they have surfaced in the last uh, few months. Our PPP loan forgiveness, it is ending on March the 3rd, 2024. And with March the 2024 20, ending, uh, ends your chance of getting it forgiven. So we still have talked to, I have talked to people in the past who have said, you know, for whatever reason, I have not got my forgiveness yet, and really now is the time to do it, because even if you're paying on it now, you can still get that loan forgiven. I don't know if you can get the money back that you paid, but you can still get it forgiven. Our 2023 December storm disaster, which occurred mostly around, for, around Ventura County, and there was three or four counties that were affected, including Kern County, is open. As I have mentioned, uh, not heard a lot of damage. Uh, don't have a lot of clients that are actually uh, pursuing this, but it is SBA disaster funding. And so it is the 3.75% funding that would be available for that particular aspect. So got that going on. And uh, the winter storms from last year, last February and March is closed. We still have the City of Bakersfield Entrepreneurship Grant Program open. And they are still uh, uh, still grants that are open, last uh, last I heard, which was just a matter of a few days ago. Uh, the city of Bakersfield has a, a security and safety program that is mostly being utilized in the downtown, but other areas of the city will apply. And we have various funding programs that are open and going. So here's just kind of a PDF that I threw up that was just kind of showing an overall background of the PPP as, as we go away from that nearly uh, the program that nearly started four years ago, uh, but really about 11 and a half million loans of which the last reporting from this, which is a government website on some of the pandemic relief, 
shows that 10.5 of those million have been forgiven. So still about a million that have not been forgiven. Maybe some of them uh, are not eligible to be forgiven and they're never going to actually have the opportunity to try to get rid of that debt. But it was designed as a loan that could be forgiven. And if you've run into problems and you've run into problems with your lender or whatever, do still seek to get that forgiveness and still seek to try to get away and see if you can find how you can get that done. Because you only have now until March the 2nd. And just a quick snapshot of the loans, uh, again, showing that 10.5 million of them are forgiven out of 11.5 and a few stats right there. Okay, well, let's shift to one of the last longest running pandemic relief program, and that was the, the retention credit, uh, the employee retention credit, which allowed a tax credit um, for many for many businesses, and uh, it was up to $26,000 per employee. It was eligible only if you kept those people on your payroll back in 2020 and 2021. Well, the IRS has started uh, thousands of audits and hundreds of criminal prosecutions into determining exactly, you know, if there are any, uh, if there are any people that uh, really didn't deserve that. And you have to remember that this was a program that was heavily marketed by third-party sources. The SBDC, I'll, I'll say it again, I've said it a million times, is that when this all was going on, we were asking you to please go through your financial advisor, your CPA, your tax preparer, your enrolled agent, whatever, your Uncle Mildred or Aunt Mildred, whoever kept your books for you. Um, because what really what it involves is it involves in doing amended tax returns if you get this credit. So the people that would get the credit would end up paying some tax back because they had underreported their taxable income by the very nature of this credit. We knew that going in. So there was a lot of that, and there's a lot of third party third party marketing firms that were aggressive and maybe didn't always represent. Uh, the facts of the situation because they were different for each lender. So if you feel that you uh, might have got the credit in error or maybe you were ineligible and you don't want to risk going through potentially an audit, uh, there is a chance to get 80% of that money back. So 20% can still be retained by you. You don't have to go back and do then the amended tax return filings. So if you have a corporation, for example, that's going to be an amended return filing for your corporation in those years, and then also an amended return filing for your individual taxes. So you're going to incur a lot of, a lot of accounting fees as well. So uh, just kind of uh, having people look at this, it's a, it's a situation by situation basis. It does not, is not one shoe fits all. Um, which I really would like to have. I, I would like to start a company where one shoe fit all. I think that would be a great business. But uh, it isn't um, something that, you know, it's something that each individual business needs to look into. So you have to notify the IRS by March 22nd. So we're coming down to five weeks on that. You cannot be under criminal investigation or have an employment tax audit already underway. Um, the ship sailed for you if those two things are already happening, but um, it is open for those that, uh, that you know, employers don't have to pay or repay the IRS any interest, which is another aspect that's uh, valuable. And they're allowing employers to deduct the full wages from income taxes. So there's some real benefits there. Because generally, that is why you have to file the admitted return for your business entity. Because when you take a tax credit, maybe it's a different tax credit, but when you take the tax credit, you have to reduce your employee wages by the amount of that credit. So if you have not done so or gone back and done that, then those tax filings are wrong and uh, subject to potential audits and just a, just a big mess. This whole thing is a big mess. So also under the agreement, owners, uh, employers relinquish their claims and the IRS won't impose civil penalties on them. I don't know by just saying civil penalties that there could be others. Uh, and it isn't providing amnesty for those that are subject to criminal uh, uh, prosecution. 
So the other thing we've been following is the business ownership information filing that needs to be done. And the good news is, is as these rules continue to change, is that the filing is now due on March 31st, 2025 for those business entities such as a corporation or LLC that were in business before, before January 1, 2024. So if you were in business last year, you're fine. You won't have any subject, you won't be subject to penalties or any of the other requirements until March 31st. If you started a new LLC or corporation uh, in the last, in the first six weeks of this year, since January 1, then the filing is still due on 2024. Now you will recall, you need to go to the government's FinCEN website and FinCEN is an acronym for the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. And you need to provide personal information to identify, fully identify contact information and ownership levels of the individuals owning that in that corporation or that LLC. So a lot of states had requirements or some states had requirements where you didn't need to provide your personal address and other contact information. That is all changing now to uh, assist the government in its fight against money laundering and many other activities that are illegal. So at the SBDC, we're encouraging owners to get the report in soon. So really, you still only have, you have now until March 31st, 2025, and they're going to continue to talk about it. Uh, but really, if you get it in, you must also note that any changes in your operation, any changes in ownership will result in an updated or amended filing. One area where we're starting to see a little problem in this is where you're uh, potentially selling a business and there could be a particular escrow or escrow on uh, some business property. So we're seeing some of that stuff pop up and um, we're hoping it's not going to continue to be much of an issue. Our capital quarter function. Yeah, we do capital quarter here as a regular basis on Webinar Wednesday. Haven't been doing a lot of it lately, but uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about a lot of lag ag lending programs that are out there from USDA and other programs to assist new farmers and new ranchers, and also for those that are already in existing ag operations. We could be talking about uh, programs such as, you know, offered by SinCal Business Finance Group, which Maybe you are a food processor and you're looking for a processing center of some kind, and maybe it fits the SBA 504 program and others. So there's a lot of ag lending programs out there. So don't hesitate to call or contact your local SBDC to find out more on how you can find ag lending. One of our, uh, one of our really, uh, we're really still super pleased with this program and it's it's for individuals that want to run a daycare business, a home daycare business out of their home, and it is to assist them with the business side of learning that, the licensing through the state of California, what you can do and can't do to make it a profitable venture for you, and to provide child care and daycare activities for other people working in our community. Kern County is a child care island. It is referred to as that. And it's because we have limited child care options and they are quite expensive. So anything that we can do uh, to help, you know, not only those self-employed, but those employed, it is great. And it is a good business opportunity and a great situation for many people out there. We have a lot of tools at the SBDC to help you. Here's a lot of them. I'm going to touch on those right now. Our community calendar is going to look at next week is the Economic Outlook Conference in the Indian Wells Valley. So if you do business in Ridgecrest or maybe at China Lake, Naval Weapon Station, China Lake, or potentially even uh, anywhere throughout the Indian Wells Valley, it's a great event to network with people from Ridgecrest and the surrounding community. It's a, it's a fantastic event. You'll see me there. Also, our YouTube channel, we're up to nearly 400 subscribers. If you want this webinar to come to you on a weekly basis, when it is uploaded into YouTube, usually about 48 hours after the conclusion of the webinar on Wednesday, then just subscribe and you will have that option to have it come to you directly. Uh, we had mentioned a, our presenter a couple of weeks ago, Michael Ballstadt. We're going to provide some ultra premium content. It's not often that we charge for content, but 
This is going to be a five series. It's going to be $99 outside of our usual just premium content. This is ultra premium content that will get started in March in the later part of March. And we'll have more information on this next week. But he is a certified exit planning advisor. And really, if you're going to sell your business, it's great to get a plan together and actually carry that plan out to get the full value and to protect yourself after you potentially sell the business. Our Central California region of our SBDC program has a six-part social media webinar series. The first one was yesterday. As you see, there are six sessions. These are all free. I imagine the one from yesterday was recorded, uh, but I was busy yesterday, so I'm not really sure, but uh, I'm sure it's recorded. You can go back and catch up on one, but I think a lot of these are not really building blocks or are actually mutually exclusive topics, maybe a standalone topic, but would be great to take in a series of six. There is information somewhere on how to sign, you know, contact the SPDC. I don't really see how you sign up for this on here. But anyway, we'll get to that. We'll get that straightened out for you. Also, the uh, Bakersfield Food Management Program. We talked about the city of Bakersfield's program still being open. Our friends over at CSU Bakersfield Extended Education still have options for the food service management class. It is on demand. You can take it when you want. It is, I believe, uh, eight modules and about 12 hours of training. It provides training to uh, actually allow you to apply for a City of Bakersfield grant if you're in that particular program. If you're just getting into a food service business, it's an excellent program to get the basics of operating a food business. Uh, there are some of our on-demand features, our human HR service hotline information. Had some great reports on this from, from clients and others. Uh, if you're in Kern Inyo and Mono counties, please call 888-201-5817. Take a screenshot if you're in other counties and you can call it there. It is uh, HR services provided free of charge from the California Employer Association, which brings us to today's special guest and my friend, Dr. Aaron Hedgay. He is a professor of economics at CSUB, a former chair of said economics department. And he has now transitioned to a role as the executive director of the Grimm Family Center for Agricultural Business, which is a center providing opportunities for student research, field experiences, and also the creation of new innovations in technology. He also, at CSUB, chairs the Academic Senate. Dr. Hedgay serves on several boards of uh, various agricultural entities and has been a runner for over 15 years. Aaron, great to have you on today's webinar. Great to have you back. Take it away. Thank you, Jerry, for that generous introduction. Uh, I've been a runner for 20 years now, so a little past. Wow. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, so um, I will. I put together some slides, so if I may, I will share these. Um, as as Kelly mentioned, uh, I'm currently the executive director for the Grimm Family Center for um, Agricultural Business. And this is a center that uh, was established with a generous $5 million fund endowment uh, from the Grimm family, uh, specifically Barbara Grimm Marshall and Kerry Grimm Anderson. Uh, and it was early 2020 in the height of the pandemic when this gift was made. Uh, and we had a founding executive director who was appointed in July of 2020, Mr. Caetano Urias. And then I took over as the executive director in September of last year. Uh, the mission of the Grimm Family Center for Ag Business is to be a conduit in the area for uh, all things related to agriculture, uh, especially here at the CSUB. We have an ag business program that Kelly mentioned earlier. Uh, it's to also help promote that program and support it too. So, uh, and to date, what we've been doing, and this is a continuous thing, is having a speaker series. We have it uh, every month, uh, at, towards the end of the month, on the last Wednesday of the month, in the evening. Uh, and then we also have some uh, student research uh, that is led by faculty mentors 
So they uh, work on certain topics related to agriculture and or food uh, and represent various uh, uh, departments and schools within the university here. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's also supporting the Ag Business Program, supporting the Ag Business uh, Club, the Student Club, and then uh, opportunities for uh, mentoring and helping some research and things like that. What we also have uh, is forthcoming probably later this week or early next week is the inaugural issue of the Central Valley Journal of Agriculture and Food. We hope to publish this twice uh, a year. And in this particular issue, uh, we have an article by uh, uh, Dr. Deal, as Kelly mentioned, who's the director of the Ag Business Program at UCB. We also have an uh, article by uh, Abe Padilla, who is also an instructor here at CSB, but also is a part-time instructor, uh, but also is uh, the owner and the founder of uh, Spectrum Analytics and is uh, a whiz with data analytics. So he's looking at the almond industry. And then yours truly, I have an article in there looking at the impact of uh, the pandemic uh, uh, on uh, trade, specifically uh, dealing with almonds. And then uh, in the coming months, we'll also have some podcasts, uh, not any webinars because we can compete with, with uh, the SBDC and Kelly as the, the ultimate uh, webinar host. Uh, so we'll have some podcasts, some blogs, and then work on some documentaries. And then we'll also have uh, uh, conferences and symposia. So look for all of those things forthcoming this year and in the years beyond. Uh, so uh, a little bit about uh, the speaker series that I mentioned. Uh, so in the fall last year, we had um, three great speakers, and you'll see these are the flyers for those. Uh, we are in Iger, the first uh, speaker we had was um, uh, Ms. Kuka Montoya, uh, who is an alumni from CSCB and is also an artist. And so you see a picture there that she painted. Uh, she did a lot of work with um, uh, uh, farm workers and the painting and representing farm workers and the uh, life on the farm and those kinds of things. Uh, so we had a great uh, uh, talk and students stayed behind and she'd set up all of her art. And so everybody got to witness the art and, uh, and some even purchased some of the art. Uh, and then in October, we had our, our, our former president, President Zelezny, uh, who was really instrumental in working with the Grimm's to get the Grimm Family Center for Agribusiness at CSUB, the largest uh, gift of its kind to date at the university. Uh, and so she also uh, is a poet. And so in the conversation, we found out that she likes to write uh, uh, poetry and poems. And in this particular case, she did one on uh, uh, the Grimm Agricultural Business, the center and the Grimm family. And uh, it was very well received and we had a nice little reception. And then we ended the fall term uh, with a uh, um, uh, speaker uh, who uh, works for the Natural Resource Conservation Service about sustainable agriculture in the Central Valley here. Uh, and it basically ran through all of the different sustainable practices that many of the farmers engage in that people may not be familiar with. Uh, so as you all know, farmers are stewards of the land and, and many of them do uh, amazing work at being sustainable. So, so you don't often hear about that. So, so that's what uh, Marcos, uh, uh, Marcos Perez um, uh, talked about. Uh, so in the spring, uh, we've got, we're excited about this. Uh, uh, look for some flyers coming out. Uh, at the end of this month, on February 28th, we have a panel on SIGMA, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Uh, and we'll have on the panel, uh, at least two of the people that we're featuring are uh, Mr. Paul Goslin, who's the Deputy Director of the Department of Water Resources. He's also the individual in charge of all of the SIGMA plans in the state of California. Uh, and then we'll also have uh, Ms. Patty Poire, uh, who's the former Executive Director of the Kern Groundwater Authority. She also is a former uh, president of the Kern County Farm Bureau and really an expert uh, on especially Sigma, but also on water issues and things in this region. We'll follow that up by, on Wednesday, March 20th, uh, a panel on wine. Uh, we'll have three panelists on there talking about you know, growing of the wine grapes, processing those wine grapes, and then selling of the wine. Uh, so that will be on March 20th. And then the following month, uh, which will be our last of the spring series, uh, on April 24th, we'll have 
uh, the uh, speaker talking about uh, Basque agriculture, which is also a really big part of agriculture and the history of agriculture here in Kern County. So that's what we have in terms of the speaker series coming up. Uh, next, I wanted to talk a little bit about student research that uh, has been done in this past year. So as uh, Kelly mentioned, one of the objectives for the Grimm Center is to be able to uh, help uh, develop student research. So in conjunction with their faculty members, students from the Department of Biology, and there were two students that did that, uh, and in economics, and we had a couple of students working on economics as well, and then history. One of them was an undergraduate and the other was a graduate student, and then political science. So, so the general idea is they work on a topic uh, uh, supervised by their faculty mentor, and then uh, at the end of the year, so in November, uh, they present their research in terms of what they've been doing. And it's a very broad area of research, as long as it covers agriculture and food. So last, uh, uh, this past November, uh, November 17th, we had that symposium and you'll see the students listed here uh, and the different areas and their topics that you can see. Uh, um, all, every topic was interesting, but one of the ones I thought was really fascinating is uh, from the history, the undergraduate student, uh, Gabriel Moore, uh, who talked about looking at the role of Chinese uh, immigrants in agriculture historically, looking at the archives. And it's really hard to come across a lot of that kind of information going back 100 years or maybe even 150 years and so. So so that was really fascinating, I thought. And you'll see the faculty mentors listed there. As I mentioned, uh, Dr. John Deal, um, who is the director of the Ag Business Program, and then Dr. Skamuri from Political Science, Dr. Francis from Biology, Dr. Kamiabi also from Economics, and Dr. Mulry from History. So we'll be doing this again this year. Uh, we'll get uh, at least four students, maybe more, and then around the same time in November, we'll have another symposium. So again, look for, uh, we have a uh, Instagram page. I don't know how that works, but our intern uh, posts stuff on Instagram. So please, um, if you're on it, sign up for it, and then we'll be getting a LinkedIn page as well. Uh, so please uh, affiliate yourselves with us, on social media, and 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 hopefully you can, you're able to attend some of these uh, events we have, especially in the student research, uh, which they really do an amazing job. Uh, so just looking ahead, uh, we have more of the student research, as I mentioned, and then uh, we'll start a, a, a faculty research program as well, where one faculty member uh, will do a research, year-long research on uh, agriculture or food-related topic, and then we'll have them present also at, at some point during the year. And then in November of this year, we'll have a second annual student research symposium. Uh, and um, we've been talking about it for a while, but uh, at some point, uh, working along with Kelly and the SBDC, we're hoping to have a, a conference, an agricultural conference, uh, focusing on uh, ag tech uh, and maybe also just other topics related to agriculture. In April, uh, we'll have a career fair on our campus here. Uh, so to help, uh, and, and typically we get about 20 or so uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture agencies and then 20 or so other uh, regional agricultural companies, like the big names to, to the smaller uh, ag companies. Uh, and we typically get two to 300 students go through during that career fair. Uh, it will be in, in April, um, sometime mid-April probably. Uh, and then, of course, we're working on getting scholarships to ag students. Uh, as you all know, it's uh, expensive, especially these days, to, to attend college. And so everywhere we can give and support the students will to do that. And also thinking of other ways of supporting the, the, the Bachelor of Science in Ag Business program, which I like to tell folks is, is we're better than some of the known ag programs around the state because most of the folks who teach in that Ag Business program are people who work in that industry, uh, with the exception of Dr. Deal and I, both of who, us who have our PhDs in agricultural economics, but everybody else works in the industry and uh, the word is spread. And we have a lot of uh, folks in the industry looking for students such as ours. And so, um, so it's been pretty successful and we're 
fortunate uh, to get all the kind of support we do, and, and the Grimm Family Center uh, will be continuing to do this support. One other thing that we'll be doing at the Grimm Center is tracking some data, especially local data in terms of agriculture and then food. So one of the ones we are currently tracking is this thing we call the Bakersfield Breakfast Barometer. So the idea here is to look at what does it cost uh, for a typical breakfast for one person uh, in Bakersfield. And then we'll track it throughout time, uh, monthly, uh, look at it from three months and six months and such, and, and over a year to see uh, how much that has changed. When you hear about the inflation uh, uh, that, you know, if we have time, we can talk about, uh, uh, it usually is like an overall inflation level, typically. And then they have another one called core inflation level, which is excludes uh, energy and food because those are the most volatile prices. Prices go up and down. So, so with that, well, let's see if we can come up with a measure that's local, relevant to folks in Bakersfield, that will also have some implications about uh, um, what happens with the cost of food. Uh, and uh, if you've been following the news, you know that the cost of food, or if you've been shopping at the grocery store, has been increasing. Well, I have some good news to share. Uh, comparing from November of 2023 to February um, of, of this year, uh, here's these, this barometer. So we've set up the barometer to look at what a typical breakfast might look like. Some of us have different things, but in general, a typical. So maybe you have two pieces of toast, uh, spread a tablespoon of butter on those toasts, maybe you have an egg, a couple of slices of bacon, uh, eight ounces of orange juice, uh, eight ounces of coffee, and put uh, a little bit of cream, maybe about a, a fourth, uh, 0.4 ounces of uh, cream. And then the price you'll see in the next column for each of those things, uh, as you would buy in the grocery store, either for loaf, pound, or dozen, or so many ounces. And then the cost uh, uh, per uh, meal. So two slices of toast, from a $4.98 uh, uh, dollars per loaf works out to about 55 cents, which is in the February 14 column, compared to November 15 when it was 62 cents. So the price of bread in that intervening three months or in the last quarter went down 11%. And you can see butter went down about 1%. Eggs went up about 3%. It's a marginal change. Bacon went up 5%. If we had looked at this, the six months before November, that price of bacon would have gone up 53%. And if anybody's interested, I can tell you the reason why that had gone up. And you see orange juice, uh, coffee and cream have stayed pretty stable. So this kind of reflects the national trends as well as the international trends because things like coffee are sold on the international market rather than just the domestic one. Uh, but the whole thing is that average cost has gone from $3.21 in November, on November 15th in 2023, to $3.19 today, Valentine's Day. And uh, so there is a little bit of red there, and it's a decrease of 1%. So for the most part, the food inflation, at least as we track it using this uh, barometer, has been consistent in the last um, quarter, last three months. So. That's all I had for now. I think there's a lot of things uh, still to discuss, potentially, Dr. Hedgay. Um, first of all, uh, speaker series looks outstanding. Looks like you guys are doing a fantastic job with that. Are any of those uh, speaker series from 2023, were they recorded or do you plan to record in the future? Great question, and should have mentioned that they were all recorded. And then um, uh, one of these days, I'll lean on your expertise. We'll start a YouTube channel, and we'll make them available there. That's and great. And we'll record all the ones going forward, too. And some of these programs coming up are on such great topics, you know. Those that are uh, joining us from the ag industry, they're very familiar with Sigma. And so now I get to throw you a pop quiz. Can you, Sigma is an acronym. Can you actually name that acronym? Are you asking me or the audience? You. Oh, yeah. Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. 
Yes, and it is a huge issue figure, uh, facing agriculture as uh, groundwater and also surface water becomes critical factors in California agriculture. So that's a, a great one coming up. And um, and I'm really intrigued on this March 20th uh, panel on wine. Uh, will, there be will there be tasting available? Um, until we can confirm with the university, I can't say, but we're working on it. Oh, great. That'll help attendance. <laughs> and have you have you uh, aligned the panel yet, or can you talk about that yet? Or Because, uh, you know, we have a great wine grape growing region in Tehachapi here in Kern County. Mm -hmm. And it is, uh, it is really on the upswing with some good wine, outstanding wines coming out of there. More producers, more quality and grape growing, just a great viticultural region, has its own American viticultural region, uh, the AVA, the Tehachapi Mountains. Um, so uh, anything on the panel there? Yeah, so we have a uh, um, former student and alumni who will be talking about the grape growing of grapes. And then we have um, somebody from, I, I believe it's Allied Grape Growers, who will be talking about converting that into wine. And then we have uh, somebody from local uh, wine place, uh, Campo, that will be talking about the retail part of it. So one of the, our hopes for having this panel was just as you mentioned, Kelly, is to make people aware that, you know, while grapes are one of the top five commodities for Kern County, uh, we're also doing, and, and those are table grapes, not wine grapes. We're also increasing uh, uh, grape production, uh, wine production, I should say, not just in Tachibi, but also in the Valley too. So, so just to bring awareness to that. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And then on April the 24th, on Basque Agriculture. So yeah. three outstanding programs. I'm, I'm going to try to hit all three of those. Thank you. And please do. And, and, and if you're not able to, we'll record them and make it uh, available on YouTube. But we're hoping uh, if we can, maybe we'll try to get some Basque food. At, mm. Some at more that. tastings. Yeah. Well, I do recall uh, in the last year or two, we had a uh, we had a fellow who was here on Basque Studies mm -hmm. from the Basque region of I believe the Spanish coast and actually was here. And I remember talking to him a little bit about agricultural practices and a lot of the huge ag background. So that is going to be fascinating stuff. Yeah. Cause I think, uh, again, people may know, uh, obviously we know the Basque restaurants, which are great, but people may not be aware of the rich history of ba Basque farming, especially when you look at sheep herding and, and other agricultural ventures, which go back, you know, decades and generations. Well, I know we've been talking about ag tech, and another thing we talk about a lot is in agricultural between the two of us is value-added agriculture. And obviously, we touched on it a little bit in the wine industry, and that is one of the more obvious ones where you take grapes and add value to it. But really, when you take so many of the commodities that are grown in the San Joaquin Valley, I mean, it's just, I mean, we like to call ourselves the breadbasket of, of the U.S., but, you know, it's really none of the ingredients go into bread, so... Uh, it's a little bit of a misnomer, but really it is uh, a lot of commodities that are that are grown and a lot of them are sold at a commodity price that makes you a price taker. Being a uh, value added product, you're a price maker where you've added the value to that. So is is there something uh, that uh, we can do in the future, maybe on value added and trying to find more value added producers for some of these great commodities in Kern County and the San Joaquin Valley? Absolutely. Um, I'll give you a, uh, an example here. So when you go to Starbucks and you pay five fifty or whatever it is for, I know not the coffee you drink, Kelly, but what majority of the people at Starbucks do with with their lattes and things like that, the percent, this, the amount of that five dollars that goes to the person growing the coffee beans is less than thirty or forty cents. The rest of it is the value added. So similarly, when you grow almonds and pistachios. You might get whatever the the rate is right now, two dollars or a dollar seventy eight per pound. But then when you turn around and sell those flavored pistachios or or the flavored almonds, that's where you make the money. You know, somebody once told me that ninety five percent of almond milk is water. It's only five percent is almond, but you get a lot more value for that. So so I think focusing on our value added uh, is what something that will help 
the economy here in Kern County. The growing part is absolutely essential, but rather than shipping it elsewhere, if we turn to uh, producing adding value here, again, it'll keep a lot of jobs here and a lot of that return stays here in the county. So doctor, I, I believe you were able to attend yesterday the uh, World Ag Expo. And uh, I was just wondering, uh, you know, because I remember the first time I don't you've been there before, but I remember the first time I went and it was just fascinating the number of exhibitors and the size of the and scope of that. Um, so I guess you don't know which state was not represented by exhibitors because I'm still holding out for that. But but what were your thoughts yesterday when you went through there and some of the things that you saw and some of the impressions that were made on you? Well, yeah, interesting. I've been there a few times before. And this time uh, um, I went with my mom, who's who's on here. So hi, mom. Uh, and uh, um, so it was interesting. Always I like going with people who've not been there just to see it from their perspective. And and you really, uh, um, if you go there often, you take it for granted, you know, these big machinery and you don't think about it, right? I mean, most of us go to the grocery store and we, we buy a carrot or bread or whatever it is, and we don't think about all the process that goes into it. And then to see that, the, the giant machines, the, how expensive they are, which goes back to some of the things, I know you, we probably don't have time to talk about it, but when interest rates are high like they are currently, that has a big impact on the farm economy as well. Because if you have to buy a tractor, whether it's to comply with new regulations or because the old one, you just can't fix it anymore and you need it to be more efficient, though that price is increasing because a lot of it has new technology. Uh, one of the, the the phrases I heard a lot talking to folks there is artificial intelligence, AI, right? So so we saw this one, uh, it's not very big, but it's a sorter for almonds. So it sorts them into the good almonds that you can sell and the ones that are not, you know, they're not, not as good. You can't sell them anymore. And so, so there, uh, uh, in in that thing, they were saying the the guy kept saying, "Oh, it uses cameras and artificial intelligence." I mean, those machines have been around for a long time, right? Uh, and they use a camera sensor and and figure out any programming and stuff. But but if it does have artificial intelligence, again, this is an example of how they're using more of it. And then they had these other things about sprayers for uh, weeds and such, uh, or even planters, and which are more very precise, so that you're not, you know, in the old days of, of having an airplane like you saw in you know, North by Northwest that was filmed here in Kern County, where the, the, the airplane crop duster is going over the and everything, you're just spraying it all over. You don't have to do that anymore. You can be very precise so that and, and you know when it's going to rain or not going to rain. So so you can calibrate that. So so all of that costs money. And so that's what was on display. So there was a lot of this technology. One of the ones things is um, I saw there is uh, they have a, a almond shaker, so so it goes in you know something that uh, relatively new concept of shaking these trees to get in the pistachios and and such. So so it's very a lot of tech, and if anybody hasn't been there, I would really recommend going there. Yeah, and I, I really think a lot of what we're seeing in businesses and what we talk to people that own businesses at the SBDC is just that being in a very high labor state of California, businesses are looking at ways to cut labor. They're looking at ways, and you really, I think, I think I saw that last time I was at the uh, World Ag Expo where you're starting to see, you know, a lot of technology with uh, driverless tractors and uh, other implements as well that are happening that are doing whatever they can do to reduce the cost of labor. Yeah, so. and part of it is labor costs increasing because there's a shortage of labor. And then of course, as the minimum wage and things like that increase too, so that that has an impact. So anything, uh, and also in, in some cases, uh, the machines can do uh, tasks which humans can't, you know, it's not visible to our eye. So this, like the sorting for instance, and it does it at such a fast rate, if, if let's say five or six workers can go through maybe 2,000 pounds of almonds, sorting them in one day, the machine can do it in one hour or less. So mm -hmm. so, so that's where you're getting the efficiency and accuracy. And, and they said it's like 95% accurate in sorting these uh, almonds. So so it, it is. And But part of it is where there's labor that is lost. 
there's picking up a labor on the other end. Like because it's so competitive, getting that bottom dollar is so hard that companies have to squeeze every dollar profit. And for that, they need a lot of analysis done. So that's where the CFCB's Ag Business Program comes in. We've placed a lot of our students in these big uh, ag companies and some of the smaller ag companies also doing analysis, data analysis, scrunching through all these numbers to make profit for the company. And it, it more than returns you know, the investment that the companies make in them. So that's why they keep coming back to us and saying, we need more, we need more. And every student that we graduate gets a job and it's hard for us to, to, to grow more students in that sense. Well, uh, doctor, I know you've got to run and educate our youth. You have a class coming up, but one, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you that one question that I teased uh, with earlier. And that is yesterday you saw a big uh, drop in the stock market or relatively big. And uh, it was based at least by many analysts on the inflation report in January. Uh, do you have any comments on that? Sure, yeah, the, the market, well, the Dow Jones, I think, went down 1.4%, which is the largest drop in, in quite some time, but it rebounded today. But the thing about the stock market is uh, it, it reacts to expectations. If information comes out that is different than what they expected, then it goes up or down by a lot. So one of the things that uh, the market is hoping for is that uh, the Federal Reserve lowers the interest rate in the next little while. They're hoping maybe at the March meeting, but anytime information comes out like this, where the inflation number was 3.1% for the month of January, uh, overall inflation, uh, and they were expecting 2.9%. I mean, it's still a great decrease from when the highest when we had like seven or 9%, but it's not as low as it expected, which means that the Federal Reserve is not ready to cut interest rate just yet. They wanna wait till it gets to 2%, which is kind of their um, target in one sense. And I, as long as it's hovering near three, they they will cut interest rates at some point this year. But it's just a matter of, if not March, probably May or a little later in the year. And so that means that it makes it a little more difficult for companies to make the profit so the stock market doesn't return. So that's why you see people shifting money from the stocks into bonds and the bonds rallied. So, so I think maybe one more month, and if the inflation rate comes down below three, if with a two something, then I think you'll see the market rally back up again. But already it's coming back anyways. Well, fantastic stuff. I know we have a lot of small business owners on variable loans that are looking for those rates to slide down this year. Absolutely. Well, any any last comments, doctor, before you depart? No, just thank you for having me and, and thank you for doing this webinar. I mean, you know, you started it back in the pandemic and still going strong, regardless of what's happening. It's people can count on. So uh, something to to look forward to for us in, in this Grim Center to, to model your consistency and the value you add to the economy. Well, thank you, Dr. Hedgay. And as always, it's great to have you on. And thank you again so much. Thanks. Okay. Okay, we covered that inflation. Just real quickly... I wanted to uh, just go to our slide for next week, and we will be back next week um, for webinar number 310. And, you know, cruising the Q&A, no Q&A this week. Uh, the chat box pretty much is there. Maureen has added a lot of different items here, some great commentary, but also information on topics that we talked about in the webinar chat on the PPP and the employee retention credit, voluntary disclosure. A lot of information there also on programs that are great for individuals that were wanting to start daycare. The nurture training, no cost training program where you receive a grant that we talked about. Also some of the other things, um, some great comments in here. Um, and um, I will make sure Dr. Hedgay gets uh, the message, the chat message in the chat on the Kern County Black Farmers Association and some of the history related to that entity and also uh, Black farmers in Kern County and maybe even in Tulare County. Um, so yes, uh, a lot of great comments in here, a lot of great information in the chat, but no questions. So seeing no questions, 
We will move aside and be back next week for webinar number 310. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Have a great day, and we'll see you next week.